Okay, welcome back to another Corn's World chat. Uh, today's episode, I'm chatting with none other than my mother. So I had my father, uh, I had my brother, I had my sister, and it was only right that my mom comes on uh, the show to chat um, to talk about who knows what, what we're going to talk, talk about. about. <laughs> um, I wanted to have you on just because you are my mother, um, but I wanted to get a sense from you. The last couple of days, she's out here in Illinois uh, with Molly, myself, Molly's mom, uh, my stepfather, Gary. For the last couple of days, you've been watching our daughter, Nix. Um, so I wanted to start off the podcast by asking you, how's that been? Um, and has it brought you back to your motherly instincts um, with a young child rather than older child, which you have now, older children. Talk? Yeah, you could talk. <laughs> um, it's a privilege. It really is to be here with um, Nix and to just spend the day with her. Mm -hmm. And it's it's not really the same. It's, um, I don't know, when I had my kids, everything seemed very Who are natural. Corin, <laughs> Davina, Jed. Uh, it, was, it was very natural, very organic. It was, It seemed like um, I just felt like I knew what I was doing. And if I didn't, nobody else knew that, you know, I was doing anything wrong. Mm -hmm. But um, we had our way of taking care of people. And now with Nix, you guys have a whole different approach. Um, doctors are telling you all different things to do. And where we used to use bumpers and pillows and blankets and cribs, you don't do that anymore. And so it's a learning experience that um, new grandparents have with their grandchildren. And it's a respect that we, I feel that I have for the two of you on what you're learning and what you're doing and all the research you do just to um, make sure that you're giving your child the best of everything. And Nix is just the best of everything. I mean, she's coming, she's so smart. And I feel like I spent a day with, I hate to say a friend because she's a little girl, but um, she made it so simple. It was everything we did. Um, she lets me know what she wanted and she answers me. She's very verbal, even if it's one word sentences, it's, it's just easy to understand what she needs. And we spent the day in the library and she showed me all the different things that she knew. And uh, in, she has her own mind. She just, um, she wants things at a certain time and she's not demanding. She'll ask you for it or she'll do something that she wants to do. And then when she doesn't, she'll tell you she doesn't want that. I know right now she's on a no kick, but it's not a no like a defiant no. It's no. Like she knows what she wants. She knows what she wants, but she really doesn't connect no with the word no. Mm -hmm. It's just she doesn't want to do something and she'll say no and let you know it and go on and do something else. So let me, let me ask you something. Where do you think kids, um, seeing that with Nick's and seeing like your children, where do you think kids get that from? Because, uh, and this is something I spoke to dad about, was um, I think kids are born where they have like their own personalities and they're gonna be their own person regardless. But do you think that, you know, parents shape that in a kid or like she'll she'll just be who she is? Or like, like I felt like I was always more like comical because you were more comical than dad. Whereas like Davina was maybe more serious and dry humor and dad was like that, you know, like how, where do you, where do you think that develops with kids? Well, like, I, th I think it's a combination of their environment and certainly the people that are um, caretakers. And you could tell that Nix has laughter around her mm -hmm. and um, she's always learning and she loves books and she has people that are genuinely in love with her. Mm -hmm. So it comes through and I may not get out here that as often as I'd love to, and I know you guys travel a lot and come to visit us, but she just has a sense of people that when I say I need a hug, she comes over and truly hugs me, mm -hmm. and we haven't seen each other for a long time, and 
you guys make it very easy because you do do FaceTime and we uh, send pictures and we have all these um, the tiny beans is an app that you know, we uh, Molly's very good at um, posting pictures and it's just such a pleasure to be so much a part of your lives that even though there's a distance um, we really don't feel it so I don't know I think that a child can sense when there's um, what just things going on in the house that aren't aren't good. Mm -hmm. I think that they know when things are happy in the house, and it just shows in who they are. So we we had a very happy household when household when you were growing up. Mm -hmm. That everybody was always active and and doing things, and we traveled and. But if so, things weren't going well in a household, because uh, it's not. I mean hidden for us but my parents are divorced but like so if you and dad ever got into an argument like we didn't see it and like that was maybe good for us maybe bad for us um but like and this is something i talked to molly about is like if we have an argument like should we have the argument in front of nicks like is it important for kids to see parents having like a disagreement from time to well, time i think it's age appropriate mm -hmm. um i don't think that um People, the parents should disagree with each other in front of a child. Mm -hmm. I think that you should always back each other up. And uh, even in our divorce, I never talked badly of your dad. I, I still think he's a wonderful person, mm -hmm. and you know, there's no regrets there. But um, I think that's important that children know that family is family and that people really love them. And whether you're with them or not all the time, um, they get that sense of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I mean, that's something that I'm thinking about, too, with Nick's is just, like, there's going to be points of, like, something I admire about you is I've never really seen you get, like, angry, and that's something that I really, like, always, like, looked up to. You're always, I mean, you still are, you're always very happy, and you try to find the best in every situation, and even with some things, like, re really terrible, you'll lighten it with, like, a joke, or you'll try to, like, you know, you'll try to make it a, a light thing because I don't know what your thinking is behind that but like what is your thinking behind that well, like are, have you always just I don't know you as a kid but like did you always just try to make the light like have fun in situations and just if something was very serious um whether it was in school or if someone passed away like how did you always just how have you always been so positive well, I, I think I just was brought up in my own family, um, always being with other people around us. We had a very close-knit family. We had a large uh, number of aunts and uncles mm -hmm. and siblings and cousins. And um, it was very important that we had a Father's Day picnic every year and everybody got together. And so I never felt alone, no matter what was happening. And even in my own um my own with my own siblings I had an old I have an older brother and an older sister mm -hmm. uh, they were going off and doing their own thing and I had been at home the longest and yet I had cousins all over the place that we were very close with so I really didn't need a whole lot of friends I had family that was there um, to be with me so I think also my mom and dad entertained all the time and there was always room for more people so like even though we're Jewish, we had celebrated Hanukkah, but we always thought that it'd be nice to have uh, a little bit of Christmas. So we used to put um, holiday lights on a, a um, plastic tree that we had in the living room. Yeah, I mean, room. you still do that. And, like, you just are very inclusive. Yeah, and, and well, and then my mom used to get gifts for everybody, and mm -hmm. we always had extra gifts just in case. And so nobody ever felt like it was uh, they were left out. But then again, when my father's father used to come, who was very religious, uh, we used to take everything apart and take put it away until he left and then put it back out again. So we weren't so upfront about it. But uh, but where do you think, did you see that with, uh, like, because I knew your father, my grandfather, Grandpa Murray. I knew him as he was on the way out. You know, he was sick. Mm -hmm. um, but obviously... And I'm not just saying this because she's my grandma, but I think I have one of the greatest grandmothers in the world. She's just the most personable lady. She will just talk to anybody. She'll invite you to anything. She'll make you cookies. If you're a mechanic or the, the person mopping the floor at a restaurant, she just 
will be the most friendliest person to you. Did you, did that help you in like being the positive person that you were? Like, did I you notice so. that in your mom growing up and grandma? Um, like that, like, she, I mean, she's well, very. What I remember is just that sometimes I would say to my mother, I want to take off from school today. And she'll say, well, I have a funeral. You come with me to the funeral, I'll take you shopping afterwards. Mm -hmm. So it was always fun. <laughs> and so we would, you know, I'd sit quietly at the funeral for the memorial service, and then we would go out. And at that time, she would have to pick something up at a store, and it was no big deal to leave a kid in the car. And she used to say, if the policeman comes, just tell him I'll be right back. And I would tell them that you'd be right back. And so she always made it like, it was nothing and, mm -hmm. and she worked all the time and when she came home dinner was on the table in maybe 10 minutes um we really didn't eat all together but then my dad would come home and he would eat, eat his meal and um so it, it just always seemed like it was fun and with my my mother now she's 94 years old july 13 95 um she also she always had a sense of humor she always uh, did include everybody and in what um, was going on to this day. She's an impeccable dresser and she loves to look good and have fun. And she um, barters with her cookies where, you know, most people live on a fixed income. She lives on a fixed income, but she'll um, pay people back in chocolate chip cookies. And just out of the goodness of her heart, well, if, like, yeah. she'll bring so them they, to a restaurant or something. So, so I guess I always had it around me. It was just uh, always a good thing. Um, to have people that I trusted and, and not to feel nervous about anything. Um, what, um, so you say like grandma would say if the policeman comes to you in the car, like her parenting and goes back to the parenting thing with how we are today versus how when you were a parent, how your, our, our my grandmother was a parent to you. What, like how is it balancing for just from the last couple of days like you trying to and this is something where, that I'm trying to figure out also is just like the freedom of letting the kid like letting my daughter do what she wants to do and just you know maybe she'll fall and hit her head or something like that whereas you know Molly's very by the book and I always refer like hey when my mom was growing up like they didn't have car seats and like all this type of stuff like wh what do you think is so how I, I think know. that research has, has shown that there's better ways of doing things now, okay. you know, where um, we may not have known, we may have had a high chair that was not safe, mm -hmm. we may yeah. have had a lot of paint chips or things around that uh, that we really weren't worried about, because we just didn't always plug up the plugs in the in the house, we baby-proof the, the house, but we just didn't know about everything, and um, it's just the way that you tell people what you expect. I mean, when I came here, um, Molly gave me a, a tutorial pretty much of, of, of how to do things. Mm -hmm. and, and the first time, I think it was, everything was written out and then um, we referred to it as um, the holy grail that uh, we knew what to do at this time and this time and this time. And then now it was more abbreviated because I'm sure that trust comes into it but it's just such a privilege to be the caretaker for the day for Nixon to be able to put her in a car and take her someplace and know that I'm being trusted to do that. I remember um, your brother Jed, before he had his baby uh, Cammy, he also wanted me to, to watch his baby eventually, like, and he saw me helping you out. Mm -hmm. And so he said, um, if you had the baby for the day, would you just leave her in the car and 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 that would be it? And I said, no, you know. So yeah. He says, okay, I'm just testing, I'm just yeah. testing, you know. It, it, and I think that since you guys are okay, then well, some of my best there. memories come from when like your screw ups are like, well, they're partially mine too. Like I'd be, I have one sitting in the top of the hill at our old apartment complex, and the car was like in drive oh, and right. it started rolling yeah. back or like. Um, being at Disneyland and or we Disney lost World, you a couple of times. getting lost or you fell out of a car once. Fell out of a car, but like <laughs> those are memories that I have forever. So like without that, I know now when I sit in the back seat, I make sure that like the door is super locked. Right. When I go to Disneyland now, I'm gonna make sure that my daughter knows where like the um, like 
lost and found spot is where if she feels lost, go here. Like, so it's like without that, maybe I would have lost Nick's at Disney World. Well, it's trial know? and error. Yeah. And, and I'm glad that you're here with us so that we so didn't mine. lose you. Yeah. Um, but it's the same kind of a feeling, you know, as a parent years ago and a parent now, if you take your eyes off your child and they're not there in a, in a moment and they can just be two steps away, yeah. you know, your heart is in your stomach and it's really scary. Mm -hmm. um, you want to do the best all the time, but you know, there's no real one book on how to be a parent, yeah. a good parent. So um, all the experiences that we have growing up are ones we, we have with us all our lives and you know you pass it on to your child so let me i want to go back a little bit to when you were a kid a little bit more um so you grew up in brooklyn mm -hmm. um and you guys would go to saratoga on the summers my grandmother uh, had a house in saratoga springs my mother was born in saratoga springs uh -huh. with her siblings and uh so we used to go in the summertime and we used to grandma had a the house that they lived in was turned into little uh, apartments and in the, everybody had a room and then they had a common kitchen mm -hmm. and uh, the people would cook and they would sit out on the porch and I would go and my, I had a, my cousin Denise who I was very close with lived in Bayside Queens and she um, came from a different background because um, her mom was very protective and she always dressed her to a tee and she was always neat and clean and so she would sort of run away from their house and come to my house for the freedom of just going out without any curfew and, and having anybody right on top of them. Mm -hmm. And so she used to meet me in Saratoga. And So um, she would come from the city to Saratoga? So she would come from, um, so Denise would come from Queens and I would go from Brooklyn uh -huh. and we would meet in Saratoga oh, Grandma's wow. house sometimes. and. We would sleep over and usually would sleep in her room and uh, all the other rooms were rented out and sometimes in the middle of the night if you have to go to the bathroom you'd have to walk through the this common living room through the kitchen and the creaks in the floor you would hear and you were afraid that people would be waking sounds up sounds like my stepfather and, <laughs> and then you would uh, just go to the bathroom and come back but and also we would sleep in grandma's room and we would hear her snoring all the time uh -huh. And once we got really scared because she like stopped breathing and we thought, breathe, Grandma, breathe. Oh, wow. And then she did. It was just, and so, but we used to play all these different games and mm -hmm. we used to go, they have a lot of spring water there. Yeah, they have um, like that, um, it's Number like, one water and it all smells from sulfur. Yep, yeah, yeah. We loved it growing up because we saw all the adults drinking it and we got used to it. And we used to fill up people's jugs and go there and they used to give us a quarter. And we thought we were making a lot of money. And we used to just have all these escapades. Like down the block was a, um, a black church that um, we used to go to. And we were the only local white children that used to go in. And it was just warm and friendly. And they used to sing these songs. And we used to just sit there and sing the songs. Yeah. And we thought it was great. And um, So it sounds it like, like, at, like my grandma, Grandma Amy and Grandpa Murray were very like laid back like were they strict at all with they you were, doing anything like not really my mother was the authoritarian okay. but um and but she they, they she never hit me and, uh -huh. and maybe my brother was the tester uh, -huh. uh but um my father he always had a good sense of humor and stuff he always used to hold everything in if he did get mad at my mom he would just burst and, uh -huh. and start yelling and sometimes we would just run in the room and just say, stop already. Mm -hmm. But um, most of the time they were in good spirits and they just always, my father was a, what you call a kibitzer and he used to go talk to people and you'd stand online and he would talk to everybody. So I think I got that from him. Mm -hmm. And Do you think that translated to you as a parent? Because I, I don't remember you ever saying like, you have to be back by 11 o'clock or like you were not strict at all, you know? I guess you just always seem like a like a, and you still are just like a free spirit, like just. Well, I was like a free spirit, but I just remember when we were going to sleep. Um, sometimes I'd be tired and I'd fall asleep in the living room, and you guys still would be up, you yeah. know, and and so. Which you still do to today. <laughs> it it just happened to work out, I guess, and even in the uh, w there was a swimming pool where we lived in um, in Hartsdale, and. Um, 
people used to say, whose kid is this? Because I didn't stand by the pool where all the other parents were and watch you all the time. I just sort of had a lot of trust. Yeah. Oh. And it worked out okay. I mean, like, we, we made it. But, yeah, you did trust us a lot. Um, also, as a kid, you... Well, you traveled a good amount as a kid, right? You went to college, I, but then you lived abroad in Holland for a well, little bit. First growing up, my mother's father's family settled in Cuba. Okay. And so when I was a young child, my mother and I used to, and I'm sure she did it with the other kids, but I just remember that we used to take the old uh, propeller uh, planes and we used to go to... Um, to Cuba all the time in the really? summertime. Mm -hmm. Oh, I didn't know that. And they were very wealthy people, and they, the uh, cousins used to own like department stores. And so we used to get to their house, and they had maids to take care of me and dress me. And get, this was get as a shower. kid, like how old? Yeah, this is in Havana. Uh, this was uh, several years when I was like uh, six, seven, eight. Oh, oh, young. Yeah, and so they used to take care of me, and uh, my mother used to be with her cousins and. We would spend a week or two, and I just remember right before Castro came in, we were on a, um, a bus, and we saw these troops in the uh, street, and my mother said, come on, fast, and she grabbed my hand, and we went into a taxi, we went home, and that was the last time that we were in Cuba. Wow. Um, so, I just remember, and then all of my family left with whatever they can put on their back, and they um, went to Miami. Wow. And, and you, started all over again. You've been back to Cuba since then, right? Didn't you? No, go back I didn't to... make it. We, I was supposed to go to Cuba. Oh, okay. I thought you. Were... I, we we take these trips all the time, yeah, yeah, yeah. Gary and I, and uh, we were supposed to go, but it was right after a big storm. Oh, okay. And it, everything was really demolished, and we thought it's not a good time to go, so we switched our trip. We went to Africa instead. Oh, okay. We went to Tanzania, so we didn't make it. Do you have? Do you, would you want to go back to Cuba and see some of your old? I like, would. Okay. I just. I feel so ashamed that I don't speak Spanish, you know, fluently. My sister is a linguist, and she and speaks son. French and Spanish. My son is a Spanish <laughs> teacher. Um, so you my, have the means to learn how to speak Spanish. I know, Spanish. I know. Well, Jed won't teach. He I mean, he teaches in his classes. He doesn't want to teach outside of that. Well, I I will give it a better try, but I my grandchildren, I have uh, several grandchildren that speak Spanish now that I have to keep up with. Mm -hmm. So it's hard. So that's what's holding you back is like sort of is no, that you don't I speak Spanish? Oh, okay. I, would, I would go to Cuba. Yeah. Um, it's just I think that I would enjoy it more if I spoke Spanish. I mm -hmm. can understand some, but uh, no, I, I would go absolutely. There's no place that I don't think I wouldn't go. Yeah, yeah. I true. love traveling. So. Um, also, as a young child, you well memories I have of you is that you were at Woodstock, right? Yeah. So how, what's the story behind that? Were you like really into music or like how did that come about? That, I, what, that you I really didn't to to... know what I was doing. <laughs> I mean... But no I, one really did, right? Like, uh, no, there were a lot of people that were into music okay. and they really knew what they were doing. They were going for peace and love and drugs and everything. But um, it was really a fluke. My mother um, knew a woman who had a daughter who was also going and mm -hmm. she thought it would be fun for my sister and I to go as well. So... She found a, an old age home that was renting out rooms, and so she got us a place to stay in a this little is cottage. Out, for, out by Woodstock. In Woodstock, yeah. And um, she secured the place for us, and we went. And we didn't realize that what was going to happen, but uh, my sister Ivy and I were meeting people and we're walking around, and I met some guy um, just talking on the street, and he said, I want to go up to the front of the uh, the bandstand and I want to just see everything. And I said, I'd love that too. So I said, okay. And I said goodbye to my sister. Cool. And, the two and there were no cell phones and nothing, nothing, right? Like, were you worried that nothing. you would ever see her again? <laughs> like... No, the, everything was, I, I trusted. I just yeah. trusted. And uh, I mean, I used to hitch. I mean, there was like no fear or so. But because um, we didn't, there wasn't like criminal minds and all these crazy shows that you would yeah, watch. Yeah, yeah. So it was never something to think about. But I'm, I'm sure a lot of people, other people thought of it. But, <laughs> Maybe. Uh, so we, I went with him to the uh, bandstand, and we, he put out a blanket, and we sat down. As soon as we got there, he says, okay, I'm going to check out now. I'm going to leave. I said, you leave? we just got here. He says, no, I don't want to stay. So he left, and I stayed. And there were the, um, all these, these towers and everything, people climbing up, and then they were making... Uh, a lot of 
speeches and they were saying that there's bad acid out there and don't take this and don't take that. And I was just very innocent and I was sitting on the on the, somebody's blanket and people around me were smoking grass and I didn't smoke grass and at the time and they were all coughing and I was thinking, Ugh, it's like they're choking, you know. Yeah. But I just sat there and I listened to Country Joe and the Fish and I listened to um, well, the Beatles Hendrix. Were there? No, the Beatles weren't there, oh, were. but Hendrix was there, and there was uh, um, just a whole lot of people that I still didn't really know who they were, Yeah. but I know them now, and uh, then it was so dark you couldn't go anywhere, and there's thousands and thousands of people around, so I just stayed, and I slept on the, on the um, blanket for the night, and then in the morning I figured I'd better get back, and so... I just started heading back to where I thought the cabin was. And I remember being on the road and I hitched and these two guys stopped and they picked me up like fathers. And they said to me, they said, we picked you up because you were wearing a bra. You weren't like one of those other hippies. So I said, okay. And they took me to where uh, the cabbage was. Wow. And my sister was there and she said, I was worried. I said, well, I'm okay. And she said, okay. And and that was, we got together again. That's crazy. Yeah. But it was, you know, it, even when you see these thousands of pictures of Woodstock and yeah. people, I'm still looking for myself. I mean, it could be anyone, but I was there. But, um, and you kept, you still had the ticket, right? Because I remember when we were growing up, you had the ticket framed in a I thing, right? I had framed, yeah. That was, um, they actually, after a while, they didn't ha need tickets and people were climbing in because the fences I'm were sure. down. I will, I think you remember you saying like the highways getting there were just cars they were stopped, closed down. right? Yeah, it was just like packed. Yeah, a lot of people couldn't make it because it was packed. Well, yeah, I mean, I we drove past Woodstock's exit when we go. I went to SUNY Cortland, my brother and sister went to SUNY Binghamton, and you pass it on the highway, Route 17, and um, it's just a tiny little place. So to think of all these people going yeah. there of just this one exit, like. And this is 50 years now, the anniversary, and they're trying to get another concert oh, really? there. But they've been having problems securing the land. Uh, I think that there's two different events going on. Well, I think it's just a. I think I heard that it's like a family that owns like the barn or something, well, right? Well, there's the Yaskas farm. Uh huh. But they're not there anymore. I'm sure. But they're I'm sure they the family or someone still owns it. I don't know. Um. So what was that time? What were the What was the times like in the '70s there or whatever? Or yeah, because it was 1969 was Woodstock, right? Mm -hmm. Was everything very like war, peace? like well, craziness was, going on a lot of people were being drafted it yeah. was scary and in my high school were you worried school, for your brother or anything like that well, my like, brother was in school and he was going for medicine uh -huh. so you know for dentistry so he really wasn't um a candidate for going to the war but um people i knew i was going out with a guy steve rosenberg and would you he, only date steves <laughs> <laughs> no but he um he almost went um but he didn't mm -hmm because he was the sole supporter of his family. I mean, all these different uh, reasons that people got out of it. And um, it was a crazy time also in school. We didn't, I don't believe my school had a prom because they felt that it was not a right thing to do. Oh, really? When kids were going to war. So we just, it was not a big thing. So nobody had a prom. Did you have any like role models that you looked up to as a kid or as like a teenager? Like, were there any women you looked up to that were powerful or even like men was there anybody that you were like i want to be like that person or that they're doing a good job or something like that not really no? i mean all i remember is that uh movie stars i liked dick van dyke because uh -huh. i thought he was funny when he used to trip and i just liked his personality and they lived in new rochelle which now you live in new rochelle right. which is pretty actually cool. there's a street right near us that's uh, oh is dick that where van they dyke. lived on? It, it was referred to on the uh oh really call rhino who wrote it uh -huh. um was living there or his parents lived oh, there. oh wow so it's called dick van dyke, dyke way huh but um i'm sure i had role models but i was just involved in life you know going around we had soupy sales that my cousin denise and i woke up at five o'clock in the morning one time and took the train into the city and we're wearing these soupy sales um, bows that he had like a bows it looks like a clown bow what, what was soupy sales soupy sales has he was a guy that had a tv uh, station mm -hmm. and he worked with kids but he was just silly and he had all these little um, characters that he had 
I think it was thing that was just a hand that would come out and go, eh, eh, eh. and he like very silly thing, sort of like um, Pee Wee Herman. Okay, but um, so he sold the tie things. And well, that was one to... of his, his the items that he would wear, and so people would wear it going to his concert. Okay, and he would be on stage, so you sort of want to emulate him, so you would wear that. And we had Soupy Sales buttons, and uh, so we we went into the city just to see him. You did really like uh, Barbara Streisand. Well, I like Barbara Streisand, yeah. Yeah, what, what, like that because was she was just talented. She was just like talented singer. Yeah, she was a actress. Brooklyn girl, uh -huh. and, and I, I guess just her voice was so pretty. And, yeah. Uh, and so I went to her concert, but that was later on. Yeah, I, was, I remember like growing up, you had like Barbara Streisand yeah. CDs, and like were like a big Barbara Streisand fan. So after. But like, also growing up, we, uh, my sister and I, we had we loved Cat Stevens. Who's okay. Yeah. Now Yusef something else. He changed his name because he's he did a lot of praying and he was in India, I think. Uh huh. And um, we used to have those eight track players that you used to stick into this machine that was huge, and we had it in our bedroom when we used to go to sleep at night. We always went to sleep to the T for the Tillerman, which was one of his songs. And oh, he also sang the cats and the, the, cats cradle. In the cradle. Yeah, yeah. But. Um, we would put tea for the Tillerman on, and, and the whole al album would go round and round and round. I remember my father used to come in after we were like in bed, almost asleep, and he used to change, just shut down the um, the switch, and he'd say good night, girls, and he'd go to you know we'd go to sleep. And once my sister and I went to a uh, Cat Stevens concert, mm -hmm. and I think it was like Radio City Musical or someplace, and we just had this vision of my father coming in and <laughs> shutting the switch, and all these people that are sitting there won't hear anything anymore. So. Um, so then you you lived abroad. When did you move over to Holland? And when did you go abroad? I went to Kingsborough Community College. I was studying um, phys ed, mm -hmm. and then my sister wanted to. Well, my sister, I think she got married, and then she got annulled, and she wanted to do some traveling. She just had to get away from the New York, and so we said, let's go traveling together. So we did, mm -hmm. and. We started off in Paris, and then we went, which was fun, but she spoke French and I didn't. So a lot of the experiences were translated through my sister. And I remember we had met like two guys and um, she was doing all the translating and we went into one of their cars and she was in the back seat and I was in the front seat and then she started like, throwing her hands up and trying to get this guy away and I saw that he was like being coming on too strong to her uh -huh. and I like turned around and I started cursing you get your hands off my <laughs> sister like I was crazy he so they got scared of who we were so uh -huh. they they said get out get out we got out of the car and we were like happy we were alive there but we left Paris and we went to Holland and it was like night and day Holland it was a typically well, unusual actual warm day in Holland. It's usually chillier and the sun was out and the flowers were out and people were just walking and smiling and bicycles going by and I just fell in love with it. Yeah. And uh, so we stayed there for a while. My, uh, Ivy and I met a lot of people. We used to hang out at the, the Vondel Park and we used to sing songs with these people that we met. There was this guy, um, he used to um, sing just a lot of folk songs and um, so it was just a nice experience and then I ended up going off with a guy, an American guy that I met, uh, Henry Tatro, we called him Tate, and we went traveling and my sister decided to go to um, Spain and my parents were traveling and my mother said, I, at the time there was so much going on in, in the States that she said, I hate that you're far away but I know that you're safe and we're coming to visit and Daddy and I are going to come to Amsterdam see you, but if you want to travel, we're going to go to Greece. We have like all, this whole agenda of going to Israel and Greece. And if you can meet us in Greece, then uh, we know that you're going to be okay. Mm -hmm. So we said, okay. So Tate and I took trains and we traveled through Europe and we met them in uh, Athens. And they had already come to the end of their trip by flying all over and uh, we ended up staying in Athens for about a month, but my parents came, spent some time with us, and then they left. And then when we went back to Amsterdam, and I decided to stay. 
And so I was in Amsterdam. My sister was in Spain, and my parents were very happy about it. And you never got no, like homesick. You were fine with just being away. Like the only time that you really feel bad about not being with your family is holiday time when the yeah. people go home or they go to family. Then you feel like I don't have any place to go, and somebody might take you in. And I was never a very political person, but being an American, people used to say. Um, how do you, what is your stand in Israel? Which just because I was Jewish, I never really had a stand in yeah. Israel. And you sort of felt like you had to defend America as well. But well I think that still happens today too. I mean, I'm it's sure. like, I'm not the most political person either, but like you want to have pride in the country you come from. You and know? you so do. If someone says something rude where it's like, well, it's not really like that, you know, like, and you, you want to defend your country. Yeah. Although I fell in love with, with Amsterdam where I ended up living for three and a half years, mm -hmm. because I found that there was just so many different qualities that I didn't find in the States, where you would see a young man take his little child out to the store, hold the hand and, and come back for bread, where in America a lot of times you see a father run in the car and leave the kid home and just you know make a fast errand. Mm -hmm. Or uh, when I used to go into the houses of my friends, We'd sit in the living room and talk with the parents rather than just go up to my friend's room and, and not have anything to do with anybody else in the house. Yeah. There were things that I thought was really cool, that people were people and there was a lot of dignity. And uh, I think so, a lot of that, like, you don't see that with kids nowadays. Um, and that's something that I think got passed down to us. Like, not to brag, but like, if I go to a friend's house, I'll absolutely introduce myself to their parents and make it a point to say something to them and like at least like let them know that like I appreciate them you know letting we me be in their house well. yeah but like <laughs> I don't know if that's something that just like was a byproduct of what you learned that somehow trickled down but like I feel like that stuff is still important like I remember when I was going to ask Molly to marry her the first thing you? I did <laughs> Well, yeah, whatever. Yeah. Um, the first thing I did was call her father and, you know, let him know that, you know, I was going to do this. And something he said at, at my, our wedding was that, you know, like he, he doesn't feel like that stuff really happens anymore. And maybe uh -huh. it does. Maybe people are still calling their parents. And, but I think you learning those values when you traveled abroad, like got passed down to us in a, in a good way. You know, mm -hmm. it's like, values you you learn from your parents because the experiences that you've been through so mm -hmm. i appreciate that you know yeah yeah so that's that um <laughs> that's it um i want to ask a question because i've always looked at you as sort of like when i was growing up in school i wasn't the best student um and i would always look if i had to get a test signed or you know uh if a parent had to call home i would always say to call you I always felt like you were the good parent, not the good parent, like the easier one? the easy parent. Do you think in a in a relationship there has to be like like a good cop, bad cop? Well, like, I don't think that like, it's you have to have that, but I think that very often opposites attract. Mm -hmm. And um, your dad was a teacher, so he knew the ins and outs of the school, mm -hmm. and um, so you could I, have been more was, naive to it. Well, there was a fear that you knew that he knew what the teacher was after or yeah. that you, what you were hiding. And um, I was a third of uh, three children as well, and so I was not the best student. Mm -hmm. But what I always thought about with you is that you always were a warm student. You were always loving. And where your brother was an achiever mm -hmm. and your sister uh, would study hard and she was very hard on herself to make sure she got those good point, you know, marks, uh, you were more friendly, and if you didn't get it in grades, you get get you got it in hugs, and um, I was very similar that way because my brother was always he was the first child, and my parents got him everything, and they he had every toy, every um, instrument, anything he ever wanted, and then my sister came, and she also was very. Um, strict with herself in learning, very flowery in what her, her um, uh, compositions were. And I, it was a tough that act to follow for me because we were close and in years, she was three years older than me and I was like following in school. 
and with me, I didn't get as much grades, and so I was also more reliant on my personality mm -hmm. than anything else. And I remember my sister was in band, and she played the flute, so I just knew I would play the flute. Mm -hmm. And so when I was in the orchestra, um, there were the positions where you sit when you're sitting up front, you're the best, and I used to sit in the back. I was the same way. <laughs> I just want to say that my brother played the saxophone, my sister played the clarinet, so similar to you, I always felt like, oh, I guess I have to play an instrument. So I tried the trumpet, but I would always be in the back in all the concerts. I'd be like, F9 was like the last row right next to the drums, which were all the way in the back. And the conductor, the teacher used to say, my maiden name was Winters, he said, Winters, shut up. And it's like, he just wanted me to sit there. So, I would even just, uh, and this is maybe something he did too, but I would even at a point just start moving my fingers because I didn't want to fuck anything up. Well, so... Um, and then I think we're similar in that way where we just don't want to like cause any issues. So yeah. like, if it's like, if, if I'm going to, nice yeah, or <laughs> if I'm going to, I want to be good at the trumpet. Yeah. I want to try and play in the concert and, and contribute to good music, but it might lead to a bad sound. So if I have to like, yeah, just fake it at a point. Not, so, you know, who we not when you sit all the way in the back. But I mean, I was the same way also with my mother. It's like I, if I had to have something signed, I would come to her in the morning because mm -hmm. I knew in the morning she used to say, oh, my hands. And so, OK, don't worry. And I used to sign all the papers for her so, and she, with her permission. Mm -hmm. And then um, I just we just knew who to go to. Yeah. And then with, you know, Gary, my husband, it was also the same thing. It's like he's stricter and he knows that he has, there there are rules, and you, you would know to ask me rather than him, because yeah, um, that's what he grew up with. Mm -hmm. What, um, something that I've seen from you is that you have a great uh, work ethic. And when I was growing up, you would, you, you had many jobs, so, one job that you had, you and my father, we you owned a, a diner, um, and how was that owning a diner and like just connecting with people on all different levels? It was the best. Uh -huh. It was really fun. I mean, we we got it from your dad's uncle who was getting out of the business, and um, it was I felt like the mayor of the city mm -hmm. because. It was actually near a court courtroom, and so a lot of lawyers would come in and judges, and so we knew everybody. And the police would come in; everybody would would just gather. It was the local cheers, mm -hmm. and so your dad would come in with me at five o'clock in the morning. We'd set everything up, and then he he was going to work at the luncheonette with me. But then we realized that it really wasn't necessary, so he kept his teaching job and mm -hmm. went to work. And I was there all day as the short order cook or the uh, waitress. and or pouring coffees or something. Everything. Like. And there was a woman that we hired, Rosie, that was like brought up in the restaurant business, her and her daughter. And so she knew everything. And she was very funny and she was very abrupt. And it was sort of like the uh, Jewish deli where people would come in to be insulted <laughs> and... They would come to the table, and there were a lot of regulars, and they would sit down, and they would always have eggs over easy with whole wheat toast or whatever. And so we would see them coming down the street, and she would start making the eggs and putting it out. And they'd sit there, and they'd say, Rosie, I didn't want this today. She's, what did you want? She said, I want to scramble. You'll have it tomorrow. And so they didn't care. They would just eat their eggs, and then they would go because there wasn't that much long time for lunch. So I really liked that, and it, it worked for our lifestyle, and then we started having children, and it, things started breaking down, refrigeration. <laughs> um, it seemed like we'd have to put a lot more money into the mm -hmm. business, and then Rosie actually bought the business for oh, us, really? so we got out. But uh, yeah, worth ethics. Um, I always felt that if you, you have to be a word, and that uh, if you say you're going to do something, you should do it. So I always showed up for work, and I always thought it was important to show up for school. And but you were also never like like bigger than any job. And something that I admire about you is like we had a little village down from our house, and there was a bagel store there, and you worked at the bagel store, mm -hmm. and you would like sweep the floors or mop the floor. Like there was not like there, there's nothing, there's no job 
and something that people take heat for now is like um, they say immigrants come over and they don't want to do these jobs of like cleaning the stove or doing all this stuff. Mm -hmm. Like you always did that stuff. And it was like, if someone asked you to do something, you would do it. I'll do it everywhere, but in the house. (laughs) (laughs) No, No, that's not true. You do it in the house. (laughs) No, but uh, yeah, somebody has to do it. And and I always like, especially years later, I worked at temp agencies. Mm -hmm. I used to go into corporations uh, to fill in for people. And it was always the job that somebody didn't like. Mm -hmm. And I would do it willingly and happily, and people would think that was great. And I, I guess it was just rewarding. Mm-hmm. So it didn't bother me if it was demeaning to other people. If that's their problem. Yeah. So. Yeah, I mean, you, you had a lot of jobs, so you, went, you, you I worked were, in advertising. And, uh, <laughs> some of the funniest jobs, though, were the um, you did these like seminars, and you sold like hair products. And um, conditioners. I believed in this. Yeah, how did like you, a, how did you, it was... It was a company that was called Equinox, yeah. and it was a multi, um, was it, uh, level marketing. Like a pyramid it, scheme. Yeah, like in the beginning, <laughs> well, there was Amway first, and then, mm-hmm. and there was this, um, and they had so many products, and then they had a lot of seminars. How did you get introduced to that? I can't remember who oh. told me about it, but somebody did, and I believed in the products they had primarily it was water filters and it would be for your bathtub or your kitchen sink and it's really the the future like now everybody has everything filtered and mm-hmm. at the time nobody did but they also did natural cosmetics and they did natural we used to have closets full well, of you had like to buy the products so that was one of the things shampoos and conditioners and it was and... funny because well not really funny but my family would love the products, but only because I gave it to them. Uh-huh. But nobody would really buy anything and support me like that. And it was also trying to get people to work for you at the time. It wasn't, there was no internet. Like now people do it and they're on Instagram all the time and they're always yeah. advertising. And, and, and I think it's becoming in, more popular again. I mean, like I know some people that are doing a lot of hair product stuff now. And, and, tea like, and tea, uh, yeah, it's like bodybuilding. But, um, it's just funny how things come full circle. I, like, I would talk to people, like these women, and I would say, you can sell it, you can make this money, you can get the products very cheap. And they'd be very excited. Then they'd go home and their husband would just say, no, you're not doing that. Mm-hmm. And then they'd call me up and say, no, I'm not doing that. So I was not very successful at, with that, but mm-hmm. I really believed in the product. And like there were cleaning products that I used to sell to the schools mm-hmm. that were not harmful if a child would pick it up. And a lot of times the janitors would just leave a cleanser out on the uh, table and kids can come by and and spray it on somebody else. But the whole thing that I would advertise was that um, it's safe. You can drink it and it was safe, but it was also Would you demonstrate for them? I would, I would. (laughs) Yeah. So that I was successful in buying, but uh, eventually the company did go under and then there was a civil suit, and I did get some money from it. Oh, nice. But it was basically how all these other companies now work, where you do seminars to build you up and give you a lot of selling tactics, and then you go out there and you sell. But we didn't have the resources you have now. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a lot more help now, like you said, with social media mm-hmm. and all these other things. Um, but there was also like one thing that Denise, my cousin Denise and her husband George had told me many years ago was there was also... You talk about Woodstock and all the ways that we would learn things. Um, there was a seminar called S Training, and mm-hmm. S was very severe. And it it would be two weekends, and they sort of break you down, and then they build you up. And they would, for two weekends, you can't talk, you can't eat, you can't do anything. If they tell you to get up and go to the bathroom, you get up and go to the bathroom. Mm-hmm. And then they would ask you questions, and some people would go up on the stage, and they would yell at them, and they would really berate them and that people would faint I mean, it was really crazy and you're sitting in there and then afterwards there was all a purpose for it and it was a combination of all these different um, religions and studies and buddhism and everything mm-hmm. um, and then at the second weekend uh, you complete a lot of processes by talking to people that you haven't spoken to before for, for a long time and you clean that up and there was a way of thinking and talking. And so a lot of people felt it was a cult. 
I didn't think it was a cult only because it felt that it gave me tools to deal with. No, <laughs> it gave me tools to deal. I think with she, the life. you made us go to some of those well, I too. I did because then it changed to a more gentle approach. Yeah, I actually think forum. it was. Yeah, I thought and it was, it was good. landmark education. Yeah, and I did ask you know, Jed, Davina, and you to go, and um, you still make fun of me about it, but I think that it gave you all something that kept keep you all strong and close where in your life when you have the toughest things I think the three of you have such an incredible relationship mm -hmm. and I'm not saying it's all that but I'm just saying that I think that a lot of it well know, I'll be honest I don't I don't remember what they taught us but I feel like it was just values and stuff like well, that yeah it, it's just tools to say that you you're the king in your universe and you can change assist the way that things are uh, just by changing the way things are and that you can't make up stories like um, sometimes people embellish something mm -hmm. that happened and you just have to see what is and whenever you wanted a loved one to do it you would try to convince them and a lot of times they weren't interested because they were afraid it was this cult but just a complete stranger could say I, I didn't believe in it either and I decided to do it and they, they, you, your loved one will say, okay, um, I'll go try it. And uh, a lot of my family, did my mom, my dad, my sister. All went? Yeah. Oh. Uh, your dad. Um, yeah, I remember that. Just a lot of people just on the say-so, uh, please try it. So, and, yeah, we, we trusted your opinion to go try something, but if you're trying to get us to buy something from you, we didn't, they didn't <laughs> no, want to do that. No, it's a different thing. I just remember the children's one. Is It was very... It was good. I think I remember making friends in it, and like, the, like I, I enjoyed it when I went. Well, when I went as a parent, it. you would wait outside for your kid, and I remember Davina and, and Jed did it together, and they were in a room, and I was like listening at the door. It was right before a break, and they were going to come out, and I hear a little voice, and it's, it says, my brother is a jerk, and I'm thinking, wait, that's Davina, and she was just saying that, you know, it's like, he doesn't always let me do things and he's always like trying to make me um, feel bad and I try to do this and that. And the person up front said that you have this already always listening. It's like whenever you're going to see your brother, you always think it's going to be a certain way. And you always, you should stop and then live it fresh and live each moment for the moment. It was just interesting. And then we broke and she came out and the two of them were like shining the faces and it was interesting. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I again, I don't remember exactly what we spoke about in the forum, but I do remember like a positive, it, making a positive impact on me. So good. that was good. <laughs> um, so just transitioning now to where you are. So you're retired. Um, how you help um, Gary, my stepfather, your husband with like, uh, you know, his businesses. He's uh, like a consultant for restaurants. How's, um, outside of doing that work, how's like retirement? Like, so something that I've been balancing my like thoughts around with is just like the whole, like you work your whole life to now when you get to an, a point of your life where you're older, you can sort of now enjoy the things that life has to offer. Well, so like you said, you travel enjoyed. and stuff. Yeah. No, I know. And we traveled But a you lot. can't do it as much when you have to work a but nine my to five. Big, my big, um, complaint about working is that it was every day mm -hmm. and it was a full day and it was difficult for me to get things done although you do get a lot of things done when you do work because you run out lunchtime or you do it early you do it late mm -hmm. uh, and I luckily lived not that far from home so that I could always run and go to school events and, and do other things which reminds me of a story that about you that I always think of as funny but anyway we'll get to that okay <laughs> um but uh, I retired not because of I, w I wanted to. It was uh, a job that I was doing that... Um, you had been out really, for a while, yeah. Yeah, it just it left me with no other choice because mm -hmm. uh, it, it was changing. And so it made sense for me not to work, and I was able to go on business trips with Gary and do things with him and retire. And in the beginning, it's a little difficult, I think, as an... Uh, adjustment because you do feel like you get a lot done when you work and you feel like you have a contribution to the household and now you can wake up late and you can do 
things whenever you want and you feel like it's just very frivolous mm -hmm. and you, you know you've what's the point i'm not gonna um, find a cure for cancer but uh, you just sometimes feel that you're not really accomplishing a whole lot but you do sort of work your way into having different um responsibilities every day and you are available now that i am lucky enough to have children in the area to watch the children and grandchildren and and help out and go see what's going on so your days get filled up and it yeah. is really lovely and um i think you find uh, and this is what i so for my old job um i work from home a lot and something that i uh sort of found interesting was just like there's a whole nother life outside of like when you're working a nine to five you never know what's going on during the day but when you work from home and you go to the grocery store during the day like you see all these new people and like well you said that also about schools we were talking to somebody and they said that there was a kindergarten middle school and, and uh, high school all mm -hmm. in one area yeah and w when you were growing up there were different schools in different areas yeah. and that when you would get on the bus or you would go to the school, you saw some people waiting to be picked up on one street or you, and then you went to another school and you saw a whole different life yeah. activity. So it just know, changes up the like, like your focus and your view of what's going on. Yeah. So that's why, so I think it takes time to adjust to it. Like you said in the beginning, and especially for you, like you weren't ready to retire. Um, so that made it probably even harder. But then after a while, I think you start finding your purpose. Like you, you, you play in a card game with the ladies that you know, and like, Marjan. <laughs> yeah, like you're a Marjan expert. <laughs> Not expert. Um, but like you, you find meaning in other things. You now, do, you, you know. You do, and your purpose is, um, you know, I think it is also more of a focus on personal health, which is good because as we get older, we really do have to stay healthy, mm -hmm. and. Uh, just being able to be free to travel and to uh, help people out when they need to, like be here today, yeah. which is great. Which me and Molly appreciate. <laughs> um, what was the story you were gonna say? Oh, just, um, I was working at a children's hospital and I was in, we had this, um, this clinic that we would uh, do casting for children. Uh -huh. And um, Corin was at school and he hurt his hand his arm, but he, was it his, his, his hand, and he um, didn't want to play gym, he didn't want to go to gym or something like that, and he says, Ma, I don't want to go, and please, I gotta help me. So I came lunchtime with the paraphernalia to wrap around his hand. I remember this. And <laughs> it was, um, you, it's, you it, goes on, it goes on soft, and then it hardens, oh. and it's a hard cast. And I think we even like had people sign it and we did these things and he went to school. Well, she like and, molded a cast on my fingers and I, right. I think it was middle school and I had basketball tryouts. Right, and he had thing. basketball tryouts and he wanted to get rid of it then. Yeah. And he, I said, just go to the nurse's office and ask her to cut it off, tell them it's fine. So he went to the nurse's office and, and they said, no, we can't do yeah, that yeah. because we didn't put it on. Yeah. And even though you get a note from a doctor, I can't do it. So he called me up again. He said, <laughs> Ma, I got to get this off. I need to go to basketball practice. So again, I went from lunch and I came with like this scissor and I like cut it and cut it and cut it. And he was like waiting there lunchtime and we finally got it off oh, and he went, went back and he did I remember uh, that. his basketball practice. I didn't make the team. <laughs> The long story short, I think it was probably because but it's, of you. you know, mothers always do get you in trouble. My mother got me in trouble when I was young because I had this uh, teacher that I heard was a very difficult uh, marker and I didn't want to be in her class. And so I really kept saying, Ma, you got to get me out of this class. And she came up with a story that she wrote a note and the teacher was reading it and it said that, the teacher looks very much like a grandparent that just passed away, Oof. and it's a very traumatic experience for Donna. And so, please, oh, you know, wow. could you get her out of the class and give her somebody else, and you know, she'll be able to excel and so on and so forth. Turns out they had me go to the guidance counselor and to the principal, and they discussed it, and they said that I have to fight this through and I have to work through the problems and I had to go to like a psychologist. Oh my gosh. Yeah, just to uh, figure it out. And I was like, I kept saying to my mother, you got me in so much trouble. And she said, I'm just trying to help. Yeah, no, and that's, I mean, that's one thing I appreciate about you as well. And and all mothers do this. Um, 
but like you always had our backs, like regardless of what the situation was. So like, it, like I still remember, um, I got caught stealing a pen from like a, a stationery store that like my brother and sister worked at. And for whatever reason, it was like this Dr. Grip pen and I wanted to take it. And uh, you were driving around the village and the guy who owned the store like saw you driving and waved you down. And I think he was explaining to you that I stole the pen and that you should be really mad at me or something. And like, you were listening to it. And then I got into the car and like, you like you knew that my intentions weren't like to really steal the pen. It was just to maybe impress my friend or something like that. But like, you never really got mad, you know? And that was something that like made me think like, oh, like I'm not gonna like do this again. I know it was wrong, you know? So like, that was, that was something cool is that like you, and I look at this now, in whether it's it's work or with friends um like i really appreciate people that just like will have your back regardless you know and like w whatever the situation is they know you for who you are so they like will just have your back and not always well, side with whatever you know someone's right telling from you wrong and, yeah and, you know you you saw that you did the wrong thing and it was embarrassing that was the worst part of it because mm -hmm. i know like gary had a situation like that when he was younger and his dad made him go back to, it was at the UN, and made him go back and return whatever he took. You know, it was like a crazy thing. And it was a life experience where uh, we didn't have to go that far, but it pretty much ended up the same way where you felt the embarrassment and you knew it was the wrong thing and you never did it again. So I'll, I'll end on this, and I asked dad this question, and he didn't really give me an answer. Um, uh oh. But. Do you think it's true that parents have favorite children? And if so, who's your favorite child? Oh, it's definitely true. Okay. <laughs> it's, um, no, it's usually the one I'm with at the time. <laughs> <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> um, but no, you know, it's like everybody has a special part in your heart. Mm -hmm. And it's just like a parent would say, I had one child and I never thought that I could have love for a second one. And then when a second one comes, you know that there's so much more love and that you give and you get. Yeah. Um, everybody has their own place in, in my heart and everybody is very special. And I just am so proud of everyone, all my kids and all of Gary's kids. Uh, everybody just has their own little spark. And I'm so happy that we have such a nice blended family and that we all get along so well mm -hmm. and that you're all with spouses and, and significant others that um, are very interested in keeping the whole thing going with their family and they're close to everybody around them. So you're not getting it out of me who's <laughs> their favorite, but really they're, it's the grandchildren that are the favorite now. Yeah, no, I know. <laughs> Um, anything, anything we miss? Anything you want to talk about? No, I think you're doing great. I love these podcasts. She is, she is active in the comments section. <laughs> She's night five, four, seven, oh, one, three, <laughs> six, five, seven, four. Um, she's got the, the stereotypical, like just add on whatever numbers to the end of your, <laughs> uh, username. But, um, thanks mom. Love you. Love you. I um, love you too. and, um, you. thanks for watching. That was Corn's World, my chat with my mom, and hope you enjoyed, and we'll see you for a vlog or something coming up next. Bye.